Welcome everyone. I am Mary Conley Eggert, founder and co-executive director of Global Waterworks. I am thrilled to be here with my partner, Frank Slavenic, who will share just a little bit about what Global Waterworks is in case this is the first time you have encountered a Global Waterworks event. So, so at Global Waterworks, we say that we connect drops of interest to create waves of impact. And we do that in our, in our five pillars which are uh, servant leadership, collaboration, which you're very much involved in today, and this is what, is what is the power of Global Waterworks, efficiency in water, impact, we're results oriented, and technology solutions. We have the largest open searchable technology database in water. So that's Global Waterworks. We're a community. It's a participating community. Um, you really gain from what you what you give, and uh, we enjoy having everyone here this morning. Yes, and you can all join Global Waterworks right now by going to globalwaterworks.org. And uh, all you need is an email. It is a free community. And as Frank said, uh, we hope to accelerate impact on solutions by bringing people together into communities. And uh, uh, you're going to meet some amazing people as you'll see them showing up on the screen here today. But I just want to uh, remind everyone of the agenda. Um, 90 minutes, we have an amazing researcher from Northwestern, Sarah Young, whom I'll introduce in a second who will provide an overview of a new study and uh, that will help us uh, arm us all with insights to increase the value of water when we discuss it and discuss uh, investment opportunities for people. And then um, after she's done presenting, we'll invite the facilitators of the six different breakout groups to reflect on what that means for their individual areas. And uh, then we will dismiss the groups to discuss their specific initiatives with uh, a facilitator and an expert in each one of the round tables. You have, will have the chance to meet your peers, to share what you're working on and to brainstorm together on how to adva advance some of these solutions and uh, learn about the resources that your leaders have available to you. And then we will uh, come back together to summarize in rapid recaps um, what we all learned so that we all have the benefit of uh, learn the collective knowledge of the tribe. But uh, I am um, uh, wanting you all to get into your right group and to make that easier for us. If you could on your picture, there's a little three dots on the upper right. If you'll click there and note your desires for your group. And uh, there is a listing of the different groups um, in here, I'll just share it's uh, one is women in water, um, two is building efficiency, um, three is, um, let me see, four is lakes, um, six is digital, and um, I think we had a post here. Um, sorry about that. We'll double check this. Um, um, three is international innovation, and we'll introduce the, the group instructors here in uh, right before we leave for those, but you can indicate next to your name. And if anyone has a question, just put it in the chat. We have a few different hosts who will be monitoring to look for questions and answer those. And we'll have some time right after Sarah speaks. But uh, I am thrilled that uh, my alma mater, uh, Northwestern University, has uh, birthed uh, this amazing uh, scale, a new uh, individual water insecurity experience scale to give people a broader understanding of water use and the value of uh, ensuring all on our planet have water available. Sarah is an anthropology professor who also is very concerned about food security, but she's agreed to share her slides and uh, insights here, and it looks forward to socializing that information. So your ideas and your promotion of what you learn here would be very valuable. We invite your questions in the chat. We'll share all of this. We'll have a recording on our website and continue the conversation in Global Waterworks. But uh, Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, with that um, introduction and uh, look forward to learning. Great. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thanks for joining across the time zones. I'm gonna share my slides and that means that I won't be able to see your pretty faces or the chat. So uh, you can interrupt or we can, we'll just discuss at the end and Mary's shared my email and she hasn't, but she will. Yep. 
Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to talk to you about these water and security experiences skills. This scale is interesting, but what's even more interesting is this new way to think about and measure water security. So as Mary mentioned, I um, am an anthropologist. I'm not, water is not in the name of my PhD. And my research group at Northwestern cares about maternal and child health. That's what drives what we do. And as all of you know, water is very fundamental to um, maternal and child health. So, you know, field work brought me to it as did, um, my husband, actually, he's a chemical engineer who thinks a lot about, um, who does a lot of diagnostics. And if you're interested, and it sounds like this group might be interested in, in looking at this op-ed we wrote for a Scientific American, where we talk about democratizing um, testing of water. And he's developed these, like pregnancy tests for water is a good way to describe them. I'm happy to answer questions about those as well. And there was an i person who was in that. So i I, I understand that a little bit. So somehow the universe was pulling me to water. And I'm gonna answer three questions in the next 16, 17 minutes related to water. And the first of which is what are these wise scales that I've been, you've been hearing about? And to do that, I've gotta take you back, way back to 2013. I know it was 2013 because Rora was a baby then. And I had a large uh, grant from the National Institutes of Health to study infant feeding, food insecurity in, in Western Kenya. We wanted to know um, what shaped how moms fed their babies. So we did what's called photo elicitation interviews. And that's where you give cameras to people. So they take pictures of X, Y, or Z. And as it turns out, um, we were doing a study about food insecurity, but all of these pictures were coming back about water. Women who, even though you can see there's a big sim tank, that black thing, it's a big sim tank there, but this woman is having to go fetch water because her mother-in-law, stage left, maybe that's stage right, is um, not letting her use that water. And there's so many ways that water was shaping these women's worlds that I immediately thought, well, surely let's quantify these experiences with water insecurity the way that we quantify experiences with food insecurity. So I was a young assistant professor at the time, and we had this beautiful study designed to understand food insecurity. I thought, let me, <laughs> let's measure water insecurity too. So I, I got a chance to understand how water is conceptualized. And as many of you probably know, there are lots of ways of measuring water availability. Cubic meters, flows, there's hydrology has many talents for that. The joint monitoring programs, um, a drinking water ladder, and tells us about physical access of water. So is, is, is it piped? Is it um, a, a lake? But there are other types of access too that can come between you and water security. And that includes being able to pay for water, being able to like, physically get to the water source. Are you allowed to travel by yourself? And if you do get it, is it allocated to you within your household? Um, and so then, then there's a third domain, which is the, the use. So water, we need it for consumption, but also for non-consumptive behaviors. And in those, we don't really measure what people are doing with the water. We just can measure if it's safe or not. So it seemed to me we needed a more holistic measure that captured the four domains, so availability, access, use, and then stability across time. And this is how we measure food security. I mean, every year Gallup polls collects data in 140 countries on the experiences people have if they're worried about their food, if they have to have smaller meals, if they're skipping meals. This is the standard by which we measure progress. So it seemed only natural to do so for water. And I, frankly, I'm, I'm still surprised that no one had done this already. But the high level panel on water at the UN says you can't manage what you can't measure. And that's particularly true for water and that there are major gaps. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, pulled together something like 30 collaborators across disciplines, across time zones, across career stage. And we built what we're calling the, in fact, my husband thought of the acronym HWISE, the Household Water and Security Experiences Scale. And what we did was we took 32 questions, so candidate scale items, 
that we thought had a good chance of being suitable across infrastructure, across climate, across rainfall, across cultures. And we implemented them to, and really to just stress test these questions, see if they held up. Now, I'm gonna skip the like blood and sweat and tears and statistics that goes into a scale development, but it is no small effort. They are all, if you take a picture of that QR code, you can, it'll take you to these, these articles or just agewise.org. But I will tell you what the scale looks like. So the scale is, it's 12 items. And the phrasing is how often in the last four weeks have you or anyone in your household worried about water or your supply has been interrupted or been unable to wash clothes because of problems with water and so on. Those responses are, are weighted. So if you always have to change the food that you're preparing because of problems with water, that would, you would score three. This means that the range of the scale is zero, zero times 12 is zero, to 36, three times 12, 36. It takes three minutes to administer. And we even have a short form that takes, that's four of these items and it's a subset of these and it takes just one minute to administer. Wow. Okay, so that's the HY scale. Now comes the fun part, what has it told us already? In its early days, I mean, the HY scale was published in 2019. So in some ways a lifetime ago, it was right before COVID. <laughs> in some ways it just happened. And we're now accumulating evidence that water and security experiences, not availability, not safety, but this holistic measure shapes economic well-being. It shapes nutrition, both food security, dietary diversity, infant feeding, it shapes physical health. I and mean, we've published many papers on all of this. Physical health includes, maybe you would expect, like diarrhea to be shaped by it, cholera. But we're also seeing that um, among HIV infected people, um, opportunistic infections and viral loads much higher when, when people are water insecure. And I would say the most dominant um, body of, of findings that pertains to psychosocial well-being. So the stress and a lot of stress over time leads to depression. The psychosocial burden of being worried about having enough water, being worried about the safety of the water really is, is, is remarkable. So those four pathways are, are, are you know, really filling out with um, evidence of the importance of experiences. But there's another uh, health condition that we've all heard of now, which is that uh, it's, it's really germane to COVID. So these data were collected in 2017 or 20, 2018 before I had ever heard of COVID. And you can see that roughly a quarter of these randomly selected households were unable to wash hands specifically because of problems with water, not that they didn't want to or that there was, um, as soap, not soap. This is that they couldn't, they wanted to and couldn't because of problems with water. Um, so these, like I said, this, this, all of these findings are available here. So if you just, if under impact, you can see that there are sort of been annotated what, what these papers are about. Um, in 2020, we formed a consortium with UNESCO as the scientific arm of the UN and Gallup, who has the polling organization who has this fantastic thing called a world poll. And the world poll does a nationally representative sampling in roughly 150 countries in the world. Um, we managed to raise the funds to collect data in 31 countries. These are the, the ones in blue. Um, these are represent uh, roughly half the world's population. And to do this, we used the IYS scale, the Individual Water and Security Experiences Scale. And the difference between the household and an individual is the unit of analysis. So by asking not about household, but individual, we could dig even deeper to get higher resolution data on gender. So how is water and security different by gender or by education or these individual characteristics? The other thing that's different is that we did a, a year long recall rather than a month long, which is what we've done with HYS. And we did that so we could compare prevalences. The purpose of this is to get like a, an, a sense of an, an estimate of what water insecurity looks like, like we have for food insecurity. 
So this, these data are really interesting. And I was supposed to physically be in Cairo. I was not, I was zooming into Cairo. And I had though the opportunity to present these data to the Egyptian government. So along the left are the 12 items that are in the water and security experiences scale, the IOI scale. You can see, for example, that two thirds of Egyptians have had water interruptions in the last year and a third felt angry about their water situation. And we've established a cutoff such that we can estimate that a, roughly a quarter of Egyptians are water insecure. And that estimate is really different from the way that um, the, the, from estimates generated using the joint monitoring program. So that's the drinking water ladder. That's currently the, the indicator for SDG six for water. It's one of the indicators. And according to that, 99% of Egyptians are water secure on like less than 1% are water insecure. And that's a big difference. Um, this is exciting because we can, uh, you know, with this level of analysis, we can see how water security differs by gender, by urbanicity, and, and by income. And what you see generally is that as income goes down, uh, so the poorest quintiles are on the left, um, water insecurity goes down, but it does not go away even in the highest income quintiles, which is also very interesting for, for pol policymakers to know. So the wise scales have now been implemented in at least 48 countries. I think it's more by now and by a hundred or more organizations. And, and this includes um, USAID. So the flagship food security project is, program is called Feed the Future. And it's now Feed the USAID is, is mandating uh, experiential measures of water and security in their zone of influence surveys. The government of Mexico implemented HYS throughout Mexico in their National Health and Nutrition Survey. So this means that we'll now have nationally representative data on food and water and security, as well as a bunch of health outcomes. The United Kingdom, so it's FCDO, is their development office now is mandating it in among beneficiaries. And then UNICEF is, is asking, it has trialed it in a few places, including like Mongolia to see how um, water and security looks in, in maternal and child populations. Okay, almost done. So now you know what the scales are. You know it's really, it's early days, but it's starting to open this whole world of how experiences of water shape well-being. How can they be useful? Well, there are a few ways. And one of those is to understand the extent of the problem and to identify like, which subpopulations are at risk. Is it urban women? Is it elderly people in, in rural settings? We can also use it to evaluate our programs. So oftentimes, you know, NGOs come, they build a borehole and they leave, or they build several boreholes and they leave and say like, look, we've been successful. There are three boreholes. That doesn't tell us if the boreholes are working, if people get to use those boreholes, et cetera, et cetera. So like Oxfam has used these scales to evaluate programs with a lot of insights generated. And then of course, for like a, a person who cares about public health, like me, we, I use these to understand how people's health and well-being are shaped. But because these, you, you know, we can use these scales at multiple levels for multiple purposes, we're seeing that investments in advocacy and policymaking and science, um, all of these domains are, are drawing on this kind of information. So in summary, the Y skills offer new insights in, for a few reasons. They, they bring a human voice to the water sector that has typically measured physically touchable things, like how much water, or how much infrastructure. It's more precise for pre predicting well-being. I mean, knowing that there are X number of cubic meters of water in Lake Victoria tells you a lot less than if a woman is able to bathe and wash her hands as, as she would like. The gender disaggregated data is really important. We've, that's been missing um, in a lot of indicators. And these numbers are comparable across time and infrastructure, climates and cultures. So we can take like a seven in Malawi and compare it to the seven in, in Pakistan. It's not hard, it's three minutes or even one minute. The analysis is really straightforward. You know, my sixth grader can do it. And it's, it's familiar because many people, at least in my crowds, know about food insecurity and, and the measurement of experiential 
experiential measures are familiar. So we can call this like a sister scale to the food insecurity experiences. I've already talked about the many uses and just as an example, the Six Nations um, tribe, tribal area in Ontario, this was piloted there and the results were used to advocate for water to not be turned off um, in households, in Six Nation households, because um, we, it became clear how high water insecurity was it, during early on in COVID. So it was, it's nice to see that there's a real world impact of these data too. Zach Goldsmith, who's a British foreign minister for the, I mean, for all of these reasons, he's talking about this as a smarter indicator that can hold stakeholders accountable. This is at um, Stockholm World Water Week last year, um, because we can now measure like what is the impact of these boreholes or this pricing regimen or this infrastructure investment? What is the impact? And so it's for these reasons that uh, the why scales are being talked about as a, a post SDG target in 2030, there will be a new batch of sustainable development goals and, and this is talked about as being amongst them. So my evil plans, I will fully disclose them to you. Um, in 2020, we measured water insecurity in half the world's population, but I'm now fundraising to collect water and security data in all countries. I mean, in all 150 countries where Gallup works. And that's not so that I sit on the data and write some more papers that like 12 people read. It's because these data are critical for robust policy and they can become a global public good that everyone can look to to say like, how are we doing? How are we serving our people with water security? How did that large dam impact the water security here, there, Etc. So um, it's not cheap to collect nationally representative data with Gallup, but they are reliable and robust and kind of there's nothing like it. So in summary, have I answered the questions I set out to answer? You now know what the HYs and the IY scales are. There's the implementation manual. You know that they're telling us things and we're learning more and more every day that this is still early days for the scales and that there are possible uses across all of these levels. And with that, I will end. Thank you for your attention and um, I'll do whatever Mary tells me to. Oh my goodness. I, I think we should all just give her a round of applause. So Sarah, thank you. Reminds me, um, as we all have mute on, it probably didn't sound as, as boisterous as we felt, but when I see all the hands being raised and we have uh, about 50 people online here uh, cheering you on and eager to extend that additional insight um, to the world. What I'd like to do is um, ask if, if there are any questions, you can put them in the chat. We may not be able to get to them all, but um, also, I'd like to invite uh, the speakers for the individual groups to um, to share their perspective on what this could mean to um, to the industry. And uh, also, at the same time, just mention what you'll be discussing in your breakout group. And I will call on the facilitators for this, and we'll have the experts recap at the end of the program. So, um, um, Maria Kelson, if you could start with uh, Women in Water is the group you're going to lead, and how do you think this applies to that group? Yeah, so the Women in Water group um, may be uh, people who are interested in uh, reaching women and helping women as, um, as household managers, homemakers, or heads of household, or it could be women who are professionals in the water area. But I think um, the way to dovetail with um, Sarah's research, um, the most obvious way is to think about who is already working to help women specifically and how does this data or how could this data drive the intersection of water innovations with uh, those groups that are already working to help women. Very true. And I think, um, did you have any, and well, well, we'll go through and then we'll see if we have time for questions, but Maria, that's great. And I want to acknowledge Raj Rajaram actually has a recipe for women to uh, achieve resilience uh, that he will share within the discussion group. And then uh, he'll recap at, at our conclusion. So Raj, great to have you here. And, um, and next with uh, building efficiency, uh, Hari Haran uh, Chandra is here from India, facilitates 
excellent discussions with the World of Water Action Forum, a key partner. If you could unmute, Tari, and just comment on what your thoughts on, are on what this could mean for uh, the World of Water Action Forum advancing household efficiencies. Well, it was nice to hear Sarah talking. Good morning to those of you out there. Good afternoon to some, like Dave. Good evening here to all of you here from India. Uh, well, uh, well, the the Women's Waters Day, Water Day is, uh, or the Women's World Day is coming up very soon. I think it's on the what, 8th of March, right? Yes, it is. So, uh -huh. And so you should look at something that you can do around that, Maria. Um, well, as far as in building scale goes, as Mary, as uh, Mary keeps telling me, you see, anything that you do at this scale will help you explore those scenarios into what the city can take. It's like what Sarah said so vividly. No measure of water in the Victoria Lake can help you understand what that women's plight is. So I'm saying that if you understand what you can do with that one building, or one apartment block, or could be an office block that you're working on. You can then see how you can explore that one. The second is that all this talk on sustainability, whether it's a Paris, all the wonderful protocols we have had for the last say, 20, 25 years now, can mean nothing if we can't get people at the bottom of it all, at the last mile, beginning to engage, at, at, you know, this, uh, how do I then, how do I begin to even understand what this 50 billion tons of uh, carbon reduction is that the world is now seeking to commit? Unless I know what I can do and what that can mean as a measure and manage. I'll stop there for now. I'm sure Mary will see what she can get from the rest of us out here. And then we'll see how we can break into certain, that few groups out here, as she says. And I'm looking to see what I can understand from you all on how we can take this idea and take it to more and more minds out there. Impact is all that it's about. It's not about innovation. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, Hari. Uh, Global Waterworks is partnering with the World Water Action Forum, which is achieving tremendous action, first in Bangalore and now in four other cities. We're hoping to expand to uh, all around the world. So appreciate your leadership. And you'll be joined by Greg Chick, uh, the do-it-yourself plumber in this uh, in building water efficiency. And I want to remind everyone, if you haven't already and you you have a desire for a specific room, you can note your, your desire with a number right in front of your name. And you can find that simply by clicking on the three dots on the upper right hand side of your photo. I've allocated most everyone, but if you get the wrong room, you, um, you'll have the chance to come back or if you could just change your name right now. So international, Hein Mollenkamp is going to be hosting something for European innovation. And uh, Hein, you cover the whole globe. If you could just share what this scale could mean to you and uh, what you'll be talking about in your group. Yeah, well, hi there. And uh, happy to, uh, to join the group as well. So uh, for us, uh, we are a water cluster based in the Netherlands, and we are uh, based at what we call the ecosystem around water campus. And that is all around how to create and accelerate new technologies from a initial ID and scale it up and to try to help companies to bring it as fast as possible to the market. Uh, and 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 creating and and uh, and and researching new technologies that takes always more time at the end. Uh, then you think on forehand, isn't it? So there is a great idea and then it has to be piloted and then researched and you think it will be there in three, four years, but at the end it takes five, maybe more than 10 years before it really becomes successful. And the whole water campus structure is based on the fact that we try to help with many different organizations to scale that up. And of course, you cannot solve all the problems in the world, but I think everybody should... Uh, should uh, should help everybody to 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 take the small steps and then we what we do is help uh, companies here to to create new technologies and bring that to the international market so one of our companies here uh, involved which is also in the group is Sabine Stuiver and they have a, a great example uh, with a new device which which uh, makes it possible to reuse water in a single house and save and that uh, ID 5, 50 to 60% of the water used in the house and reuse it again. And of course you cannot apply it in every, every part of the world, but it, again, it's, it's about taking the small steps and, uh, and uh, go on. So uh, 
I'm happy to uh, to have the discussion with people interested in international innovation as well. We can learn a lot from you as well. Yes, and and have this available. And and Sarah, if you have any questions of um, of the group members here, maybe we could just pause for a minute and ask your questions. If there's something you'd like <laughs> them to answer in the chat, besides where to get that funding for Gallup. Yeah, well, it's not only funding, of course. It, it it's it's a very complex, isn't it, to to try to solve the big issues which are just pointed out as well in the in the previous presentation. It's it's a very complex situation. There is not one single solution to solve it all. So uh, again, we, we, we do it in our way and we try to team up with as many as countries as possible to see where we can team team up with. So uh, excellent. Yeah. Thanks, no. Hein. Yes, you and look forward to your uh, recap of your discussion as yep. you go off here in a minute. But but Sarah, was there a request that you had uh, beyond that funding or yeah, so I mean, really, for these ideas to take it you know, to to stop measuring, to, well, to think more broadly about how to measure water, it really takes people using it. Uh, so you know, funding for data. I mean, scientists always want data. Policymakers always want data, but people just need to see the utility of it for themselves or not. And, and you can tell me it's not useful. That's information that I would find useful. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so there was a question, what does socializing mean? Socializing means like getting people to talk about it, but also getting people to use it and then getting people to support it. That's generally socializing. And then to your question, do I have a question? Yes, and my question, and you don't even have to answer this aloud, but just to think like, would this be useful for evaluating the products that you're developing? Would this be useful for understanding the needs of your community? Uh, However you define community. So you can- almost Tell me that. Yeah. Yeah, of um, course. Uh, if if you look to the markets at itself, this this information is of course very valuable for the individual entrepreneurs who want to enter markets and understand the the local situations. Yes. If if in any case their technology might be applicable in the in those markets. So, uh, but 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 then uh, again, at the end of the day, it, it is important to ha have figures and data. Eh? So it's. The simple things are what is the cost price of the water in a single market is, is for companies like Hyderloop uh, very crucial, for instance, because you can have a beautiful product, but you must also uh, be able to, to sell it in those markets. And yes. so that's so, so it's so there's not one answer to that, eh? but it starts with getting data and measuring. And but we have to take care that we do not only measure, but also take the actions to 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 try to solve the problems behind the figures as well. Oh, which is, if I can boldly ask just one more question, which is, is, is anyone planning to be at the World Water Forum in Dakar at, at the end of March? Uh, I will be there. I don't know how that meeting works. So Sarah Young, if you're going to be there. Northwestern. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, we, we should put that in our calendar. Donna's on the call here. Donna is our editor, um, Donna Kalusniak. So uh, we World Water Forum in Dakar mm -hmm. in a March. Perfect. And uh, and Sarah, I know you have to go very soon, but uh, we will continue to share your information in the community. And we have uh, three additional groups that we'll just sh hear from before we exit. And the next one is, provides a beautiful resource in the way of reclaiming our lakes. So Frank, if you could discuss what um, the, the LY scale and uh, what you're going to discuss in the group. Well, you know, we've been <clears throat> working in this area for quite some time. I live on a lake. I live on Lake Hartwell. I can see it out my window here. And the, you know, the insecurity, the, the emotional uh, impact of a dead lake when you drive and you see a lake that is covered in green or is dead is, is significant, especially in a lake community. And it's more significant from the overall from, from just the overall water ecosystem. So I think this is gonna be a wonderful discussion. Uh, I really appreciate what you have done here, Sarah. And I think that it's definitely applicable to lakes and to, to measure, but then also as uh, Dave Shackleton will definitely talk about to implement and take action. Right. Um... Thank you, Frank. So LY scale, we'll be back in touch with you on that, Sarah. 
see how to do those benchmarks. But um, I also want to point out Wayne Carmichael is here. He's the leading researcher on cyanobacteria. That's the toxin that comes from the harmful algae blooms. And he is going to be in that lake discussion group, as well as a few other experts. So, um, and uh, Dave is joining us from South Africa. So really an international group here. And uh, on that topic, we move on to next gen where we have Didier uh, facilitating from the UK and your thoughts on what this means for the next gen Didier. Hi, Mary, and hi, everybody else. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, so I am Didier, and I'm actually today in France and uh, representing uh, the Water Innovation Accelerator, and uh, more specifically, the nonprofit we have, uh, the Water Emissaries. And what it is, is um, a leadership group that is uh, led by uh, youth, uh, young students, uh, which are trying to educate the, the next generation uh, into the water industry and uh, the water crisis and how to solve it most importantly. And um, I mean, I just, I, I guess what I'm thinking right now is uh, just to thank uh, Sira, uh, thank you for the, the work you're doing because uh, as I said, uh, by educating uh, the next generation, we mean uh, getting the knowledge uh, around the, the, this water crisis that we are all facing and that means uh, getting being able to measure uh, the, the issues that we are facing today and these kind of tools are, are the ones we need for the next generations to be able to quantify uh, the problems and then uh, uh, find the solutions and act on them so that's the first step we need and uh, i'm glad to have these first steps yeah, absolutely. And we also have uh, Gagan, uh, a university liaison out of the UK here who is looking for training capabilities and the next gen. So it's wonderful to have the university environment and the next gen represented here. Thank you, Didier. And uh, uh, Stuart Rudick, who's also here, who founded Water Inno, will be joining Hein Mullenkamp as, uh, as you talk about how you innovate across the international spectrum. And uh, finally, last but not least, we have our digital group and uh, Indrani Paul will facilitate. Uh, Juan has expertise there. So um, uh, Indrani, if you could just comment on what this means to you. I know you're all about data and what you'll be doing in your group. Oh, my gosh. Sarah, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, Mary has heard that, you know, my colleague and friend, you know, Lauren has heard that before. It was my desire to show, to make, you know, water security from urgency perspective, you know, feasible on the map, such that, you know, it's, it's, it's visible to solution providers, uh, you know, really target those audience who really need it, you know, that matches the value proposition or the as assumption that the solutions providers have versus the urgency. And, and, and your data, Sarah, it has already done it. And my question is, I mean, what are the barriers are you facing to kind of getting your uh, message across and how um, uh, representing those communities are which you were successful to collect your data from? Um, so thank you for your enthusiasm and thank you all for listening and appreciating the work. Um, Indrani, would you say like you, your question is how, how are communities using these data? Um, I'm, I'm sorry uh, if uh, I wasn't clearer. Um, you know, we talk about water insecurity. We talk about solving water risk. And your data clearly shows, you know, what the demand side uh, looks like, how they feel, how they, um, you know, go through uh, the, you know, kind of risk, which is sort of invisible on the maps. So I wonder, um, uh, you know, if this message of yours is going, you know, getting across the board and reaching up to solution providers who kind of, you know, find an aha moment to really identify, you know, their, you know, the pain points, right, which they usually assume like at the beginning of their journey while developing, you know, solutions. Yeah, well, Sometimes I'm the bearer of bad news, like in Cairo, where, you know, you think 99% of your population is covered, and then you hear that maybe it's more like 
uh, it's, it's not, it's kind of like, no, thank you. Ah. <laughs> um, but then where we see these data being really useful is by like civil societies. So there's great examples from Brazil where food insecurity measurements really came into parlance. And so states, there are governors in states in Brazil, and people would say like, hey, governor, our food insecurity is like a 17. And the state over there, their food insecurity is like a four. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> and it's really coming from people to advocate to the, those who are allocating resources. I mean, so a couple of things, it's A, bad news. B, it has to come not from some ivory tower professor who's just measuring stuff and writing boring scientific papers. It's like when people see, and you know, one of the compelling things about these items is that they're, they're experiences that people get. Like, how often have you been angry about your water situation? People don't want their, their, <laughs> their constituents to be angry. The Zach Goldsmith got it. Like, these are, these are things that make people pay attention. So I don't have great examples yet. Uh, it's, but like, ask me again in a year or two, but I will say like the advocacy that, that we can do with this is, seems to be helping in some cases. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, well, Sarah, we just uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue, to socializing this, to using it, and to creating stories out of that. And that's where uh, we all benefit when we come together in these communities in more intimate settings, which we're going to do next. And uh, we've uh, mentioned the facilitators and the expertise in this whole um, community today. And what I'm excited about is what you'll gain in the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes as you are led, and each one of you brings expertise. So the groups will allow for everyone to be introduced to share what they want to give and what they want to get from the community and then uh, with the expert facilitators to brainstorm on some solutions and we ask that the facilitators come back with sort of a action step, one thing you're going to do that will advance our water sector and potentially incorporating some of Sarah's insights. And uh, we will uh, return to the main room at, uh, I'll put a warning out at 10 after, but at quarter after to do a rapid recap with the experts who were the partners to the facilitators here. And um, think, uh, any questions before we go? Mary, I have, I have something. Victor, go ahead. So, so, so Sarah, I, you know, what you said that, you know, you cannot improve or manage what you cannot measure. Uh, and, and so this, to me, this is just amazing how important uh, this is and, and, and what your work is. Uh, so two things I asked if you had a GoFundMe or something like that, if there's some sort of a social uh, platform where all of us together uh, who have a lot of influence in a lot of different places could, uh, you know, point people towards a place where you could get funded to, um, you know, get Gallup uh, involved in, in all of the countries. And then the second thought is, uh, why aren't the countries? Why would not each country say, we want to fund Gallup uh, doing this, but whatever it takes, whether it's a combination of these and, and other ideas, uh, to me, this is just critical for, for everything that we do at Global Water Works and, and everyone involved here uh, about water uh, we need that measurement. We need to know everywhere, all the time, ongoing, uh, are we making improvements? So that's my two cents worth. Victor, you're saying some of my favorite words. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for appreciating the value. I put a link in the chat to, um, it's tax deductible donations to Northwestern. Um, and, and, you know, so, so it is, it's possible. And, and there are, organizations like big companies, small companies, NGOs, who really are interested in these data, but data aren't so um, compelling as like a thing you can look at like a borehole. <laughs> um, so, and so oftentimes it's, it's more appealing to like buy a thing, like a pair of scissors than, than this esoteric data. But as we all understand, data drives all of that other stuff. Right. So do you think a, a GoFundMe or something like that where, where yep. individual Victor. people get involved, maybe? Yeah, well, I just uh, put it in know, the chat to again. To for... Victor and the rest of you who talked about funding, what if we, you know, if uh, some of us decided to get to Gallup 
and told them, guys, you got to find a way of doing the kind of work that you're doing. Don't ask us for money. You go and find that money. Tell us that you like what we are doing and that you will clear the fund for us or you will do the work pro bono for us. That's better than each of us scrounging for funds the way you guys are talking about. This is a challenge for all of us. Ask Indrani. She's been struggling. I am wrestling. Uh, Everyone is wrestling for funds. So I think you should take this, flip this, go to Gallup, tell them to get this done for us, for all those uh, eligible organizations. What do you think, Mary? Yes, I, I think we need to continue this conversation in the next next. Uh, in All March, right. we're going to talk about ways to advance uh, te right. technology and right. finance. So join us again yeah. next month, but <laughs> all great ideas. Sarah, you've hit on a chord here and uh, we hope to carry it forward. And if if I'm going to release you all to your rooms and trust the facilitators to engage with the experts and have a wonderful time. So thanks um, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. Okay, you are going, if you get stuck, come on back, but we are opening them up. Thank you all. all right. Okay. Uh, all right. So. If you haven't yet, um, you should have gotten a, an opportunity to click on the room that you're going to. Um, if you're not in the right room, you can come on back, but um, they are dismissing to the rooms and you should just be able to click to follow through there. Hopefully you're all getting into the rooms that you wanted. Let me see. Hello, Mary. Yes. Hey, Sabine. How are hey. you? I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm actually got quite a cold. I'm feeling a bit not so good under the weather, but for the rest, I'm very fine. Thank you. Nice oh, to see you again. Yeah, you too. That I assigned you to the building group, the in building efficiency, because there are two folks there who um, need to know about you. I'm oh, hoping. okay. So I wasn't quite sure in which group I should be. So I, I thought I'd just check. Yeah, so so it's group number two. I did um I did have you there. So okay. it looks like so you have not, what, not is Heinz, what is Heinz Group doing? Um it's Harry's group is doing um oh Heinz Group is doing international, but that's talking about everything around the globe. What you want is the in-building efficiency, and it looks like it's fairly light. Oh, okay. Attendees. So right. yeah, you'll get the green okay. builder from the US who can do a test on your system and okay. Ari who's running uh, water efficiency across uh, India and will be expanding to Morocco and the US. Canada. Okay, then. Well, uh, can you beam me back in there or? Uh... Yes. Uh huh. I think I did. Uh, so move to. Um, so right now you are in there. You just have to press join breakout room. Do you see that? Um, uh, no, I see, I, I'm actually, breakout room. I see a breakout yeah, room. Yeah, so join that. Yeah, uh, great. Okay. Building um, efficiency. Right. Yes. Uh huh. Okay, yep. thank you so much. So, Sorry yes, about that. Yes, and I'll join you there in a minute. Tell them I'll be right in. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Great.
Hey, Stuart, I see you here. Yeah, I'm going to jump in in just a sec. Okay, perfect. To the so, international, it's a fairly large group. So, and um, thank you. Good to you, see you. You've got me for a join breakout room, right? Right, right. Yeah. To go into international. Do you want to go into women in water or um, the um, the buildings instead? No. Because those, okay, you go where you want to go. Which is so you, you you have me going to international. Is that with Hein or I, I do, yes, with Hein. Okay. Yeah, I think it'd be better for me to go there. And does he know that I'm gonna be there or not? Um he does, but I, I would just um when you when you go in, just remind him that you came in to uh, facilitate and share the innovation expertise. So I I did share that with him in the email yesterday with you both. Okay. Yeah. So um Yes, I know you'll do a great job. Thank <laughs> you. Okay. You're welcome. All right, yes, Mary. People. Good work. Thank you. Sarah, uh -huh. Sarah was amazing. Isn't she? Yeah, totally yeah. amazing. Yeah, I definitely want to connect with her. Yeah, very useful for all of us. Okay, good. See you.